Okay, this is Greece on the AMD quad core laptop playing this game with an external resolution on my uh, television uh, set to 1024 by 768. So it's a super VGA resolution, I want to say. I have my HDMI cable hooked up to my Toblerone capture device, my Avermedia 2 Plus uh, capture device. Again, the resolution is set to 768, so I want to make sure it outputs at the proper resolution. We're going to be capturing a 768p. It's going to be at YouTube. It's going to be on YouTube. 720p, 60 frames per second, if I can help it. This is going to be a laptop run. I'm curious how this is going to perform. I'll play it without capturing some other time. I just want to see how this game performs on the capture, but I kind of wanted the game to get to 30 FPS if I could help it. But I cannot adjust the resolution, so this is going to be a problem. So like I said, this is just going to be a test run. I'll let you hear the music later, don't worry. I'll probably splice it in if I have to. I have to might crank up the audio if I can. Uh, I think my USB port just cranked up. This is just a test. We do about ten minutes of this if I can if I can help it. Just to see how it cap just see how it records, and I wonder if the resolution's supposed to be that low. Yeah, there are black there are blue bars on the top and bottom of the screen. That might be okay. It's probably supposed to be letterboxed anyway. I'm kind of forcing it to this resolution so it will uh, give me better performance, I hope. I make no promises. I tend to believe this game should be played at 30 FPS, but who knows? 60 might be ideal. But again, I'm playing on a laptop. I don't know what I should be expecting here. For a game like this, 30 seems fine. They got the fake film grain here, too. That's pretty good. I'm allowed to talk over this because uh, this game has been available in several... The videos of this game have been made available on several other channels without commentary. I think... What was it? Rock, Paper, Shotgun had a video of this that shows the first 15 minutes without commentary. So if you want to hear the music, I definitely would highly, highly, highly recommend you watch those videos. In fact, I highly recommend that you listen to the soundtrack on YouTube as soon as you're done watching this. And if you like it, I would highly encourage you to go out and buy this game. Because I pretty much bought this game because of the soundtrack. The music's actually fantastic. And this thing looks gobsmackingly gorgeous. This might be... As, this might be as revelatory uh, audiovisual experience as Cuphead was last year. Twenty, it's going to be twenty seventeen is when Cuphead came out. That I said that game was the best looking video game since Dragon's Lair, and I stand by that statement. Although its aesthetic is pretty much like this, it's like intentionally going for the cinematic film grain look. It looks like a twenty four FPS film actually, and I think it looks amazing. <laughs> I mean, I saw footage of this game, and I said, holy crap, they actually went and did it. They made a video game that actually looks like a traditional 2D animated film. And what's more is that, like Cuphead, it leans into the aesthetic so heavily that it's like, oh my god, they actually went and made a video game that looked like this. I mean, yeah, yeah, it looks like a student film, and yeah, it goes without saying. It can play with a D-pad or an analog stick. But like I said, this is going to be a test run, but it's running pretty well on this laptop so far since it just started, obviously. But even, I mean, my counter at the top of the screen says I'm running at 45 FPS. It'll probably drop as soon as I get to some really challenging stuff, but... Yeah, man. Um, this thing looks like a 20 FPS film, and it looks... Well, except for those fog effects there. Those are at 30. Yeah, man, this thing looks kind of amazing. <laughs> They, yeah, they, like I said, they really went and did it. They made a student film <laughs> into a video game. <laughs> really good one, too. Like, Academy Award nominee. That's, that's, <laughs> that, that's the aesthetic they're going for. It's like, yep, they went and did it. <laughs> they finally made that Dragon's Lair video game they've been trying to make for all these years. <laughs> Only, of course, this time they're intentionally going for the 2D aesthetic. Fully. I like, I'm expecting a bunch of dissolves now. <laughs> so I guess when that uh, Yellow Submarine uh, video game comes out, it might end up looking like this. Now I will not be complaining one bit. Like I said, we'll go 10 minutes and stop it. I'm kind of shocked the game's running as well as it does. 
But like I said, I cra I lowered the resolution, so it's 768. Whoop! Saw a hitch there. <laughs> 768p is pretty good. This game's supposed to be not that hard anyway, so a four by three resolution should be fine for a game like this. I have to turn down the volume. Turn down the volume. I want to make sure there's no buzzing during this recording. Like I said, it's a test run anyway. So it's a 2D journey, huh? Yeah, I don't blame them. I mean, I would try to make Journey in 2D myself. See, look at this. Come on. This is straight up, you know, 2D art student project. Come on, dude. Tell me you can't make like I would I would I want to play like 50 video games that look this good at this point, maybe 60. Maybe they'll make an Angel's Egg video game. Well, another one. I think they already made one. <laughs> maybe they'll make an Angel's Egg video game based on the anime that uh, Mamoroshi directed. It would look like this. It would be entirely it would be entirely formalistic, right? Like super formalistic. Actually, my brother was talking about that. He was watching a movie that came out recently. He said, is it possible for a film to be, for a film this technically accomplished to be just emotionally inert? <laughs> and I said, sure. The first two Ghost in the Shell films. <laughs> She's, you know, and most of Satoshi Kon's films. And... Uh, I, I, I know there's some live action examples I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but you know this goes with the territory. It's like yeah, formally I'm sure it's very, it's very, very I'm sure it's very gorgeous. But I remember uh, Roger Ebert reviewed a film out of I think it was Ulysses, Ulysses, Ulysses Gaze, I think it was called. It was a film out of Romania, and apparently, uh, whoops, you gotta help me out. You gotta draw the bridge for me. It was called Ulysses Gaze, something like that. It had Harvey Keitel in it. And it was like. Brown Bunny, same thing. It's like you have scenes that are just literally nothing. It's just staring off into space and nothing. <laughs> like, you know, Marborosi is a Japanese film I saw like about a decade and a half ago. I'm like, okay, this thing I understand. Like, I get this. I understand what they're trying to do and they're doing it well. So I'm not going to complain about that. But I was perfectly willing to admit that it was arguably deliberate to a fault. But I dug it. Sweet Hereafter, same thing. I dug it. Because it, they were doing it right. They were using all of that... Whoop, can I jump on this? No, I can't. Got to take the stairs. I don't think I can jump on this thing, can I? No, it's just there from the background. It was like... These were films that were so... Deliberately paced... That you knew they weren't going to appeal to everybody, but because they were able to use that deliberate pacing to actually improve the story, to make the storytelling better, to make it more immersive, that was that was the achievement of those films. And I wouldn't make the same argument about Angel's A, because Angel's A was basically them spending an hour to tell a ten-minute story. <laughs> like they needed, they needed an hour to set up what was basically a ten-minute story. They could have, basically, they could have kept a lot of the pacing of that film. It just cut, like, just some of, just some of the sequence. Even if you didn't want to cut them, just make them a little bit shorter. But the idea that you needed an hour to get to that point just seemed absurd to me. And I'm going to watch the rest of the film, because now that I know where it's going, I can, like, I was, like, I was, it felt like I could, like, go to the bathroom and not miss much of that film. But then come back literally, like, at the one hour mark and get the point. But it arguably becomes a film that works better the second time you see it because you know where it's going. So you're willing to watch it again for that, you know, to to absorb the images differently because you know what they're getting at. You're able to better, you understand the themes better now, so the images work better. Blue, white. See, here's an example. Uh, Blue, the, uh, was it the Christoph Kozlowski film from, uh, Juliette Binoche was in that one back in 1993, I think it was. That was a film I dug, because again, it wasn't just slow, it was, it was observant. That's the thing. 
I mean, obviously it wasn't everyone's thing. I think my fr my friends were. I was watching the movie with some friends, and they walked out of the film about halfway through, and I don't blame them. <laughs> but I was with it, because again, it wasn't just deliberate; it was observant. It wasn't empty; it was immersive, and that helps. It's the opposite, I would argue, of something like a Annihilation with a Natalie Portman. But I still maintain that the final act of Annihilation is definitely worth seeing. Like in a 2001 is another example, but if you like 2001, I would definitely watch the final act of that film. And then when you're done watching it, uh, or, or if you're curious about it, I would watch um, Dan Olson's video essay. Uh, I think it was called uh, Annihilation and Analyzing Metaphor, something like that. Um, his analysis of the film is way more engrossing than the film itself. Because the film itself is like maybe three times longer than it needs to be. <laughs> and it's four times slower than it needs to be. Here's the journey part. <laughs> I do have some videos of journey in case you're wondering. I probably should do a separate run of this. <laughs> without without the commentary, but yeah. I'll think about it. See, come on, look at this. <laughs> Goes right to the silhouette. Very, very, very subtle. I love it. Subtle touches like that. I'm just holding right, by the way, because you're wondering. <laughs> I'm holding right, I'm holding left. You know, kind of, you know, whatever. If Red Dead Redemption had this much, uh, had this strong an aesthetic, I might have tolerated it more. But Red Dead Redemption 2 is driving me nuts. This, I guess I can deal with. This is basically like the first ten minutes of Red Dead Redemption, only with less dialogue and better music. <laughs> so I'm willing to go along with it. Let's just be honest. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a lousy movie. It's an interesting radio play. It's got very good, uh, very good soundtrack, very good... Um, it's got, it's got good soundtracks, it's got very good performances, a lot of interesting dialogue, some interesting characters, but a terrible pace for a visual. Like, if it were an audio, audio book, I think it'd be fine, I guess. Like, if it were a, if it were a line reading, <laughs> I think it might be fine. There's your late title card. So we'll finish this up very shortly. This was about ten minutes. But I wanted to give you a good look of how of how this game runs early on so you can see how it runs on this laptop. Seems fine. Maybe it'll get really bad later, but seems fine for now. Just even got the sun behind her. <laughs> Stuff like, and now we're going to zoom in. You know, a little touch on the ground where she hits her cape. It's great stuff. You get the extra parallaxing in here. <laughs> so yeah, they add the artificial film grain. They added the, um, you know, some of the shadows, obviously the dynamic shadows. But of course, her sprite and all these backgrounds here seem to scroll at 24 FPS, and it might maybe I might need to lock down the frame rate so that it flows better. But yeah, some of the scrolling is a bit jittery, but the animation again looks like it's 24 FPS and it looks fantastic. Again, perfectly got that film aesthetic going. So it works. I think the mountains just got added to the background. It might have been masking some load times. I don't know. Get some new assets in there. See, like, like this is a windmill right here. This is right. This is something that, should, that could be in, like. This is something that can be in. Yellow Submarine. That's what I'm talking about. Like triples of Belleville, like that triples of Belleville had that hyper uh, Belleville Vendezvous. Sorry, the French animated film that was nominated for an Oscar, best animated film. Same year as Finding Nemo, by the way. Um, I would highly recommend you watch that film too. Very, mostly silent, very aggressive 2D uh, art style. Lots of heavy, like heavily stylized in this sense. You know, lots of heavy black silhouettes. Very geometric, 
aesthetic going on like this like this game right here very geometric that's a hard lines hard corners and you know very aggressive curves like I said aggressively geometric I love it and to be honest Finding Nemo is obviously the more accessible film but you know part of me kind of wanted Bevel Ramdevu to win best picture because there's something to be said for an animated film that doesn't have to use dialogue to sell it. That doesn't need dialogue to tell its story. So Sylvain Chomet is one of our better animators. The problem is, is that, you know, you have to be in the mood for his stuff. I have to finish watching The Illusionist. I started watching that a few years ago. I never could get past the first act, so we'll see how it goes. It's like, it's probably a lot more meaningful than it appears at first, but... Wasn't really wild about it when I started watching it. I mean, Bovo Rendezvous, I was hooked from the first two scenes, but like, just, it was like it was just, it was like an aggressive, a very aggressively creative uh, storyboarding in that movie. Aggressively creative, aggressively creative storytelling there. Like just the bit, like you know, har the idea of. Harv eating frogs that you harvest by throwing grenades into a pond, like that kind of stuff. And even just the stuff like how people eat in that movie. It's like it's it's such a it's a relentlessly imaginative film. So every basically every scene, every other scene I would argue, has some brilliant bit, has some brilliant animated touch. That all the great animated films have, you know, Disney's Pinocchio. What was the other? Yeah, Disney's like Disney's Pinocchio, and you know, Spirited Away. All of Miyazaki's films have this stuff. Just so much creativity in every scene. And you watch it again, and I, I would argue that Tangled has has a lot of that in the character animation. But those are like nice little flourishes. But you know, the films I'm talking about do a very good job of like getting the flourishes built into the storytelling like I said all the all the great world building they do and all the character development they do just through the animation like I said like how people eat how people walk you know, like so many animators take are really really take walk cycles seriously because walk cycles are so important in you know, developing characters of animated of animated characters sometimes I mean obviously you know, the filmation animated series did that you know Definitely in the case of Fat Albert. Fat Albert would, would, one of Fat Albert's great visual uh, flourishes was the walk style. What were those walk cycles that all the characters had? So you would watch something like Fat Albert and say, you know what, the way Rudy, you know, the the way that lanky, you know, the lanky beanie wearing Rudy character, you know, the way he sort of, the way he sort of, you know, shimmies when he walks. You know, his upper body shimmies and he. In the stride, you could kind of see in his stride the swagger, because he was a very, you know, self-centered dude, narcissistic dude. You can hear that swagger in his walk. And of course, Fat Albert had that, you know, had that bobble. He always kind of, he always kind of jiggled when he walked. I love those touches like that were always good. The show itself is kind of hit or miss, but you can always appreciate a good walk cycle, even if obviously most of the most of the show series was based on, you know. Most of the series is based on, you know, stock footage and people standing around and talking, you know, canned, canned footage like that. But because the animation, they, the character animation they had, and many of those sequences were so good, it was great to see him do it. Hold X. Okay. So I long that to hold it. It's just to explore and explain this power that I earned, I guess. I guess I think we're done. I mean, I'm not done with the game, obviously. I'll be playing them at least another hour or two of this. But, yeah. Dig it. See, look at this. Throwing an, ex throwing an extra flourish right here with the hair. I mean, come on. This is great stuff. Look at this. This is great. I'm probably not supposed to come back. I'm probably not supposed to come here yet. There we go. Boxing Daria, am I right? <laughs> Got to hold the X button. Okay, this might be a great stopping point. Look at this. <laughs> Look at this.
See, it's the Maison scene, obviously. Dig that Maison scene. See, look at this. See, this stuff right here. These are bells, right? Look how, look how great these bells look. This is fantastic. I, I'm, like, gushing over here about the way the bells are drawn. I love this stuff. See, for, see, forget, see, forget the whole, like, Red Dead Redemption environmental lighting stuff. I mean, this is the kind of art I'm talking about when we talk about video game art. Whoops! Of course it crashed. Too much art. <laughs>